what if I can fast forward my joy of this moment and take the joy I know I'm going to feel in the future and pull it into now and let that supersede the frustration, the angst, the discontent that I'm having now? Hey, I'm here with my friend Daniel Doss coming to us live from Nashville, Tennessee. How's it going today, Daniel? Going good. How are you, Brian? Good, man. Well, like we were catching up before we started, I know I'm excited. I've been following you. I feel like I've known you virtually for years at this point and really a fan of what you're doing and everything. So I'm excited for you to share, you know, that part of your journey and just encourage our audience. So kind of with that in mind, where did your music journey begin? Where did it all start for you? Thanks, man. Well, I'm excited to be here and uh, just kind of hang out with you. And same here. I've heard a lot about you. And so, you know, I'd say I got started when I was a kid. Like my parents were both musicians. My dad was a minister of music and uh, he just retired recently. My mom was a piano player. I kind of grew up in it, but it wasn't until college that I started writing and doing a lot of songwriting and started making recordings. And my first recordings were just to kind of record the song I wrote. And I, you know, I do it at church on a piano or Then a friend of mine had a studio and I recorded that and I was like, I think I should make a CD. And so we made a CD. You know, it's funny. My dad told me I should make tapes as well, you know, because like people were still listening to tapes, you know, and and I was like, dad, tapes? No, nobody listens to tapes. And (laughs) he he made some tapes for me. It's funny because now it's like, I don't make CDs anymore. You know, it's like we've, I've lived long enough, been around long enough to go through that thing. And, uh, you know, I just kind of started you know, growing up in it and then in college, just writing and recording my own stuff and kind of went at it from there. That's awesome, man. I'm, I remember, you know, I was the guy with tapes, you know, we have like the six CD changer, five CD changer. You probably had one of those in your room too. That's, I remember playing along to those things for hours and I would make like mixtapes, which these days that's just a playlist, right? Right. But, you know, but I remember having those cassette tapes and making my favorite mix and taking it with my friends and, you know, that was a thing. So I totally get it. But yeah, seeing the transition you know of music to now like our cars and computers don't even play cds my you know my my in-laws will like give us like a dvd of like a home movie of like i don't i can't have no way to play it i want to play it (laughs) what do i do with this there's no means to play this so put it on youtube and then we'll watch it you know yeah so that's awesome man so now in that process were you recording because i know that you do a ton of production stuff now like were you recording yourself or were you just going to studios like how did that kind of recording process start for you you know i remember when i was a i don't know how old i was probably 12 or 13, I, I had a tape, two tape recorders and I recorded and then I played that tape and recorded me singing along with on the next one and then bounced mm. it back and forth. I didn't even know I was doing recording at the time, but I, you know, I, I didn't do that a lot, but I just remember doing that one time recording harmony to myself. But when I was in, I guess, college, when I wanted to record, have a better quality recording than just turning the tape recorder on at church, I had a friend, a couple of friends who had a studio and, you know, they had a, a Mackie soundboard and they had a, at the time they had a two inch tape reel thing, which is cool. And I didn't know how cool it was at the time, but they had some Yamaha NS 10s. And and then they ended up getting like a Fostex D160, which we didn't really realize how much worse the sound quality was on those, but it was, but it was, it was cool because it was a hard drive. And so I recorded like an, an album there. It was mainly piano vocal. I had some instruments on a few other songs. And so I did that recording that album and released it. And then after I did the next album, my friend said he was selling the studio. And so I said, well, hey, what if I bought it? And he was like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. And so we worked it out and I bought that studio that I recorded in first. And, you know, I don't have the only pieces I have from that studio or I still have the Yamaha NS10s. And Mm -hmm. I've, I used those for years and I just recently have, I stopped, stopped using them and I'm not sure I'm going to get rid of them just because they're part of the first studio I ever owned. Yeah. But, um, But over the years, every time I would do a new album, I would get a new piece of gear or new something to upgrade my own studio and kind of produce it myself. And then through time, I began to meet other producers that just did it better than me. And so I would hire them to produce things for me, depending on the project, whether it's a demo, whether it's for, uh, you know, a release, you know. Um, But I, I had enough knowledge to kind of work pretty well with producers, I think. And currently I'm producing my stuff myself um, just because I, you know, from a budget concern. I just thought, you know, I'll just do it and I'll I'll have time to live with it and get it where I want it. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's something that I I harp on a lot. I feel like is, is even if, you know, obviously you're more than capable to do your master recordings yourself, but you see the value in the team aspect, but you know, for you even getting started, 
having that knowledge of sort of how it works or, you know, what to do, a general idea of what it is that can help you communicate your vision to the people you're working with so much better than being like, I don't know, this is all like magic to me. So just, you know, like being able to communicate, I feel like that's so strong. And that's probably a reason why your songs, you know, have gotten to the point they're at now is because you've always had that kind of foundational aspect of knowing how the recording process works. So that's really cool. So those songs that you wrote now, were you, I would imagine you started off kind of doing solo rights, you know, and did you co-write back then? Or like, how did that kind of start the songwriting side? You know, when I was in high school, I just kind of started making up lyrics and melody and I, I couldn't play anything in high school. It wasn't until college that I started playing piano or guitar. I majored in music in college, music education. And okay. so when I was supposed to be practicing, I would go to the practice room and just play very poorly basic chords and write very bad songs. <laughs> so that's, you know, I was supposed to be doing something else, but little yeah. did I know I was giving myself a crash course in, in writing. But, you know, I didn't really start co-writing till a few years after I'd been writing. I love co-writing because it really speeds up the process and you get mm. to know people. I wrote all the songs on my first like three records that were all independent and the fourth one, I think. But when I started co-writing is when I started to really develop as a writer. And that, that really helped speed things along. But you know, as far as producing those go, you know, every time I would produce something new, you know, I would get a, another piece of gear or I'd learn something better or try something new. And, you know, I, I think I could have sped it along better if I'd have tried to incorporate more people in the process. But, you know, I wasn't in Nashville. You know, I was in West Tennessee, which you might as well be 10 hours from Nashville, you know, <laughs> even though I was only three hours from Nashville. You know, there weren't a lot of people that were doing that sort of thing in that area at the time. I, I know that you you were in a, you did the band thing for a while. It, did that kind of out of college? Did you form the band then and that's what brought you to Nashville or kind of what was that story like? You know, my wife's from Clarksville, which is just right up the road from Nashville. And so we moved to, uh, I went on staff there at First Baptist Clarksville for a couple of years. And I'd, before then, people started asking me to lead camps and events. And so I'd go lead events and then I started bringing a band. And one of the neatest projects that I, I was a part of was I took a band to this camp where the, the youth guy wanted to make an album. And we didn't know much about publishing or copyrights. And uh, we were like, I think it has to be all original if we're going to do. And so me and my band, I mean, I wrote most of the songs. A couple of band members wrote a couple of songs, but we did a full length live album wow. at this camp. And what was neat about it is this was before we were using a click track or tracks. And the band was made up of like, it was like a 15 year old, a 16 year old, a 17 year old. And they were all just monster musicians. And I was in my early 20s and the drummer played drums on all of them. And then the keyboard player was like this prodigy keyboard player, and he mm -hmm. would switch to bass guitar whenever the bass player would switch to electric. So we had like two vibes. We had like a piano, kind of a Bruce Hornsby vibe. And then on the other songs, we had more of kind of a rock, kind of a third day vibe. And cool. uh, so they would switch back and forth. And uh, man, when I listen back to that record, I just, I'm amazed at these young men who just, it was incredible. It was a fun project without a click, you know, and they just, they just nailed it. freedom, man. <laughs> yeah. It was pretty cool. I remember, you know, reading or watching something with Jesus Culture and a lot of the stuff that like their big songs that really impacted the church and really the, you know, Christian culture is those were all their, like playing those for the first time at camps, like live. Yeah. And I mean, so, so there's something to be said for that. And, and, and obviously now these days, like ev a lot of records and a lot of bands only do live stuff because especially in the church world, catching that energy, you know, and that spontaneity is so vital. And I mean, of course, we both love the studio thing too, but I think there's something to be said. So that's really cool to look back on those that in that project and see like, wow, like we didn't really even know what was happening, but God still used that to kind of spur inspiration and in even now. So did the, did that band turn into the Daniel Doss band or how did that kind of come to be? No, it kind of, it kind of fizzled out. We, we tried to start it as a band, but we were both going kind of our separate ways. Um, even though they were still young, when I moved to Clarksville, that was when I was living in McKenzie, Tennessee, but hmm. actually one of them, he, uh, the keyboard player, he is a uh, Bill Gaither's piano player now. Wow. <laughs> so, and when I first heard him, I was like a youth guy at this church, this small church. And they say, you got to hear this kid play. And he comes in, he's 15 years old. He sits down and plays. And I, as soon as he got done, I said, you will play for Bill Gaither someday. No way. And today he's, he goes and travels with him and he's, he's phenomenal. He could play drums, bass, anything. And he's a good dude. Um, he's just a really nice guy. And 
Um, but anyway, but all, all those guys um, in that band, you know, we we kind of went different ways. My The Daniel Doss band kind of came about when I felt like God was saying to put together a band and go for it. He started opening doors. It was it was really neat. I had done a an album with my college band, and one of the songs called Love Like Rain had gotten some traction with Worship Leader Magazine just mm. independently, just throwing it out there. And then my that independent album fell into the hands of Norman Miller, who um, he's uh, Mike J leads proper management, but Norman started it and Mike J worked with, with uh, Norman and uh, he managed uh, casting crowns and Avalon and Michael English, all those people. And, mm. and so they came up to Clarksville and, uh, and he said, man, I want to manage your career. And I was like, okay. So as long as that career is connected with a label, you know, uh, they, they connected me with uh, EMI. And so I became a Sparrow artist and he he presented me to them like I was kind of casting crowns for them, like he was they needed a a new artist, you know. It was a and so they kind of pitched me in that way, and um, so we went that route. And at the time, I was putting together a band, and that just going to be a permanent band. And you know, we had dreams, and and we did a record. Uh, Ed Cash produced our record, and oh man, um, and so got to do some cool stuff. Did one record through Sparrow, and then it it ended. That contract ended, and it was a good experience. You know, I, I learned a ton getting to meet people like Ed Cash and, you know, he's a good dude and even got to meet Mark Hall. We did a disciple now for his church a couple of years in a row, stayed at his house. And, you wow. know, it, it's good to meet people that, you know, are seem beyond where we could connect with and just, you know, it's neat. You you meet all sorts of people in the music industry and, and they're, they're, those are two really good dudes that I really respect to this day. And, and I'm happy for Ed. He's, he's the front man for uh, We the Kingdom. Yeah. And uh, and I texted him. I was like, "Dude, are you are you okay? Like you're, yeah, uh, like touring and everything? Because he's you know he's older than me, and just him just getting out there and going for it, man. Touring is not an easy. It's more of a young man's game. And he's like, man, we're having a blast. So um, he's out there with his daughter and brother. And so yeah. Well, I remember you know I I've known Ed Cash as well. You know, doing so much. You know, such a huge producer in the Christian world, especially you know from my knowledge. And then to start seeing. You know, and a songwriter too, of course. Like, you know, he's like to me, he's like Jason Ingram and uh, Ed Cash are like, you know, the top top dogs in in this in this world. And so, like, then start to see, you know, the We the Kingdom thing happen is like, man, because yeah, they they just play like I feel like it's just We the Kingdom greatest hits on our local CCM station. You know, yes. the songs are so good and so soulful and so awesome. So it's cool that that. Yeah, it's happened. And for you to be able to connect with people like that, what, like you said, like, you know, for people to, to hear, like, this is all something that just was happening along the way. And then you were building relationships all the while and still, you know, staying connected to those people. Not that, you know, probably you haven't stayed best friends with every single person you met, of course, because we don't have capacity for that. But, but the idea that like you get to be in the same room and then ultimately be a, like a good dude. So that way, just like what you said with your, your keyboard friend, like he's a good guy. So he's he wouldn't be playing with Gaithers if he wasn't a good guy first. You know, there's a lot of talented musicians out there, but the hang is the thing, right? Yeah, for sure. Now, did you do touring as the Daniel Doss band? Were you touring with some of your label mates at that time? Yeah, you know, mainly our our management put together a tour. This we did one like major tour, I would say, and major, you know, take that with a grain of salt. You know, um, it was it was two big buses, you know, Prevost buses, and basically the it was with Avalon. Uh, Michael English, and then a, a group called a duo named Kadia, two girls. And and my band became the backing band for the tour. So that's how they got paid, basically. Because, uh, you know, the only way I got paid was through merchandise sales, which wasn't amazing. But um, <laughs> so basically, we, you know, we did uh, several dates. And I'd go up there and sing and open up for 20 minutes. And, uh, and if I went over, I'd hear about it, which is funny. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I would, you know, 20 minutes set. And then I was off because it was a long night. I had a lot of artists. You got to respect that time. Yeah. And uh, so I would go off. My band would stay on and play the rest of the night, you know, with Katie was next. And then Michael English came out and then Avalon and an intermission. And then we had Avalon and Michael English did another set. And then we did a grand finale. And this was this was the highlight, you know, for me as far as like, you know, what I got to do. The finale of the evening, it was called the We Will Stand Tour. And there's a song that Avalon did and really um, Russ Taft did it. You're my brother, you're my sister, so take me by the hand. Yep. Uh, together we will work till he comes. Anyway, so Russ Taft and uh, Avalon had done a recording of it. And what they did is they had the artists that were on the tour, Michael English, myself, and Katie had come in 
and add and replace vocals on that recording. So my voice mm-hmm. opened the song. And so on the at the end of the night, the band would start playing that song and I would walk out and sing the beginning. And then the next voice on the recording was Michael English, who I grew up trying to sing like. And yeah. so Michael comes out and sings and, and then Avalon comes out, Katie comes out and it's just every night we did that. That was just a really cool moment. And, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, we wanted to be a band where, you know, we do this forever, you know, it'd be our full-time gig and, you know, we wouldn't have side jobs or side hustles, you know, and we would just tour all the time. But, you know, a lot of different circumstances occurred within that, that just, it slowed down. And then EMI cut like 3,500 jobs, like in one fell swoop that year wow. when our record dropped. And so a lot of things kind of just came together to end that, that season. But we did get to go on that tour with Avalon. We toured with Casting Crown for a few dates, you know, out West. And that was, that was a blast. And uh, we got some really neat opportunities and I'm really thankful thankful for it. Man. Yeah. Sounds like that's definitely a life changing season to be in. So, you know, with that, what happened after that kind of dissolved? What's, what's the next season post Daniel Doss band and the label thing? I think that in the industry, it can literally eat you alive, even as you thrive in the industry. Um, So when, when dreams, so you got to keep your heart in check and you got to maintain who you are and keep your head above water. Otherwise, it'll it'll eat you up. Some of the best writers I know, I've you know called up and they said, "I'm not doing it anymore. I'm done." You know, and they just wow. got bitter um, because of things that would happen in the industry. But whenever something does fall through and end, it can be tough. You know, it can be like if it was the death of a dream. You know, and mm. and I'll be honest, it kind of fell in my lap. The you know I was just kind of doing my own thing with music, and it kind of opened wide open, and so. You know, I always said, you know, God opened the door. He, you know, if he wants to shut it, he can. And, and boy, did he, you know, <laughs> when that door closed, something incredible opened up that, that I wouldn't trade for the world. I remember I was on the phone with my childhood friend uh, named Ben, and he was up near Chicago. And he said, man, our church is dying and we're about to sell the building and just launch a new church. <clears throat> and at the time I was leading worship while we were touring, I was leading worship in Clarksville, a church we'd start. So we'd started a church back in 05. So I'd, we'd been going three years and it was going really well. And, and I was like, man, I can, you know, we can talk about, you know, I can come up there and consult or look at your space and maybe we could talk about what could you could do. And anyway, he's like, man, I'm just praying the music industry crashes and burns for you, you know, and you come up here. And, <laughs> and the next day I was having a meeting with my management and my label, Peter York and Brad O'Donnell at their EMI. And I told him, I didn't tell him what was about to happen, but I just said, man, you never know what can happen in a day. And what mm-hmm. I did know is that we were going to talk about whether they were going to do another record or whether they were going to end the relationship. And so basically they they ended it. And, and I remember in that meeting, I said, well, I, I said, you know, I, before I met you guys, I was writing songs, leading worship, traveling and working in a church. And while I've been an artist with you guys, I've been writing songs, leading worship on staff of the mm-hmm. church. And I said, after this is over, I'm probably going to be writing songs, leading worship <laughs> on staff of the church, you know, like I'm going to keep moving on, you know, and, and they are too, you know, they, um, they had their own challenges to face as a label and as a business. And it was really tough, but, but something that I noticed about myself is I don't, I don't think I was enjoying who I was becoming as a person, as mm-hmm. an individual. I was letting some things in the industry get to me and I my heart was not in a place that I don't I don't think I would really like myself right now had that taken off like I wow. was hoping it would. So anyway, this church we went up to near Chicago in Valparaiso, Indiana. We went up there and helped launch this church. It was special, you know, to stand in Lake Michigan and baptize uh, a couple and watch them turn around and baptize their kids, you mm. know, and just have a, li- a line of people out of the water, you know, out on the beach side just waiting to come in and, you know, tell everybody they're following Jesus, you know, and watch God do a work in people. And man, that was, I wouldn't trade that for the world. And so I, that was about, we were about three and a half years there and uh, Grace Point and Valparaiso. And man, I, I loved that season. We loved it. That's a great town. The mayor there is a musician. And so he came and played at our church and <laughs> that oh, was sweet. super cool. Uh, <laughs> but man, it, you know, it's like, in the industry, when you're in it and working for it and focus so much on it, the tendency is to think that that is it. That's the ultimate. But as mm-hmm. I've, over the years, I've realized that 
everybody is looks to somebody else always and has some sense of maybe it's not full on jealousy, but it's like you just struggle with wanting to be there, you know? Um, mm-hmm. and, and that, and that can really eat you up unless you keep your heart in check and know who you are and what you're called to be. Man, that's so good. And yeah, I mean, so many people view the signed artist as the top position you could ever have in a career in music, right? I mean, that's that's so many people's goals. You know, that's like every kid's goal. That was my goal when I was 14 years old, playing bass guitar for the first time. Like, that's what you think you're after. Mm-hmm. So for you to go through that experience and realize that that for one can just be a season that can come and go at any time. But most importantly, it literally doesn't define who you are. And in your experience, it was trying to change you, but for you to be aware of that, maybe not so much at the time, but even I'm sure you had some discernment about that, like that, that wasn't your, you know, final resting place per se. And and even the season after that sounds like, you know, cause obviously you're in Nashville now. So, you know, that, but but to recognize that, I feel like is so valuable to to anyone listening. Like we can't define ourselves by if we make it or not, if we get the the record deal or not, because like like you're saying, like that's that's not the be all end all, you know. So I love that you shared that, and I love that you have that. You know, that takes a maturity though to you know to go through that and and come out on the other side. Because I'm sure a lot of people, like you said, they'd quit. Like I mean, you have friends that have quit because it's too hard or whatever the case may be, but. So I love that, man. So so after that church planning experience, like how did you end it? Did you come to Nashville after that? Yeah, we were um we were there for three and a half years. Then I went to another church for a couple of years in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. It was a multi-site church and I wanted to experience that sort of church setting. And it had like eight campuses, and that was wow. that was cool because usually in a, in a church, you're like the only worship leader or one of two. And yeah. like in the eight campus setting, we had like a bunch of worship leaders. And mm. so we would get together every, you know, month or a couple times a month. And uh, it was just a cool community. I really enjoyed that. But we had a death in our family that caused us to move back to Tennessee. Both my wife and I are from Tennessee. And so we we moved back to Clarksville with no job or nothing. You know, I, I looked, I was talking to a church, but that fell through. And my wife just said, let's move. And I was like, that's weird because usually I'm the one that's like, let's move without a job. But, you know, she was, but we did, you know, God provided and and we, we took a step of faith and, and I told her, I said, I think I'm supposed to write again and focus on writing. And so when we moved back, I committed to have an itinerant ministry where I travel to different churches. And, um, and one of the things I did, I took a, a sabbatical and also I began during that sabbatical, I would go down to my studio to the basement and write a bad song or write a song, you know, I call it bad, but I would write a song and I would commit to making a demo. Now I'd produced music for years, but I'd never done it all myself to where it's like, you know, a little track, you know, and, and so I I committed to doing that. And so I would, you know, wrote a bad song, make a bad demo. The next day I'd go do it again. The next day I went and did it again the next day. And they started getting a little better. And Mm. I began to build a little catalog and I began to start, I, I knew a couple producers and writers that I'd written with from years earlier. And, and one of them that had done some, a demo, some demo work for me, connected me with word uh, music publishing and centricity. And so I had some conversations there and I ended up landing a publishing deal with word. And so I was, you know, I think we exercised all the options except one. They, when they signed with curb, things kind of changed a little bit when they went to word curb. And so they went through like a few years of kind of trying to figure that out. And so, but it was neat because I, I'd never been just a writer. I'd always mm. just been the artist. And so I would show up, you know, word is there. It's, if you've ever been on music row, it's got one of the coolest buildings, like this silver building, it's like a spaceship. And, uh, <laughs> and so it was, it was really neat to show up and, you know, you'd, I'd meet a new person and we'd write, you know, from 10 to one. And then, you know, I'd meet somebody else. We'd write, you know, that afternoon and I'd go to a different studio in town and do some writing. And, and it was a, it was a fun time. I got to um, write with a lot of different people and had some good opportunities. You know, it goes back to, you know, the success you have in the industry. You, it's hard to not compare and be tore up over who gets in what room and whatever. But, but when I look back on that time, you know, I had some incredible opportunities. Um, mm. I got to write, me and uh, Matt Armstrong and, and Tony Wood, two different times, went to the Passion City Church and wrote there with wow. these guys that were connected with house fires. And mm. and they you didn't I'd never heard of them, and I wrote with them. 
And turns out I was sitting there writing with who we all know now as Dante, Dante Bo, you know, and wow. uh, wrote with him and there at Passion City and uh, and a couple other people that, you know, you've heard of. And, and it's like, you know, I say those names just like, not to be like, wow, look at what I've done, but be like, wow, like I, God took me to places that I got to meet people. And he wasn't, he wasn't, they weren't even formed Maverick City yet. You know, that wasn't even a thing yet. Yeah. And, and I didn't know what was happening. I just knew I was just like, this is a cool ride. Just enjoy it. Mm. And, and sure enough, you know, after a few years, that publishing deal came to an end and I'd built enough relationships where I just kind of kept, I wrote with different people that I would just call up and I'm not writing as much now, you know, I'm working on some of my own stuff, mm -hmm. but you know, it's like, even with that deal, you know, I have to, you have to be careful in your heart to be like, oh man, this ended, it's over, you know, it's not, or, you know, you want to chase something else down or I met with a couple of publishers, you know, those didn't look like good fits. And I, I'd gotten to a point where I didn't feel like I was needing to write every day all the time. I was, wasn't burnt out necessarily, but I just needed to, to step back a little bit anyway, but that was a neat a neat ride to get to go ride at Word for a few years. And I have, you know, great relationships, you know, people there. So, well, so much there. I mean, for one, I remember hearing house fires, you know, back when I first started at the church, I worked at a church for six and a half years, you know, worship arts, pastor, whatever. And like, we went to experience conference in Orlando. Have you, have you ever been at experience conference? Yeah. So we were there and I remember like, like there's this band called Zealand and they played this random song called good, good father. And I was like, that was pretty cool. But it was like, their version was like pretty like rocking, you know? Yeah. So then that's what l pointed me to discover house fires. I mean, to this day, I mean, I was literally listening to house fires earlier today, like open spaces or whatever. Like I love cool. that vibe, you know? So that's so cool yeah. that your open handedness has led you to all of these. I mean, honestly, just the things you've said so far, like all of those things individually are people's like end goals, you know? And because you've just kind of, open, like I said, open-handed, gone through them. God's just kind of letting you experience all these incredible things, like all kind of in sequence, right? I mean, but it's it's got to be because you're a humble person and you're just serving God along the way. You're not making it about you. You're not getting, you know, puffed up, like, look what I accomplished. You're just like, hey, this is where God has me. I'm going to live it up, soak this up, and then we'll see what happens tomorrow, right? <laughs> yeah. It can be a challenge. You know, like I said, I think the the challenge in your heart is focusing on something ending versus focusing on what actually happened, you mm -hmm. know, because I, you know, I, I do look back and I think, man, I, I wish I could have been more successful as an artist. You know, I wish, you know, I wish those, when I was a writer, I'm like, I wish those artists would have called me back. You know, I wish that mm -hmm. relationship would have burgeoned, you know, a little more and, you know, and there, there are things and opportunities that I wish would have led to more, but what I have to do is say, okay, what did I get to do? You know? Mm -hmm. And like, wow, that was, that was a cool opportunity. Like, and just treasure what that was instead of what it didn't be become or what I was hoping it would move into. Just be like, man, that was just a cool moment. And I think perspective is a, a word that, you know, I have to keep, you know, in my mind is like, what is the perspective? Well, right now, you know, I get to have a studio over my bonus room, over my garage, you know, and my boys' bedrooms are right outside there. And like, they're homeschooling and it's like we we get to do life together. Like that's mm. to me at the end of the day, nobody, the person's gonna be sitting by your bedside when you're taking your last breath aren't gonna be the people that you wrote songs for, or produced for, or sang for. It's mm. gonna be the the people that loved you the most, your family that's close to you. And you can't outsource that. Mm. I can outsource production on a record. I can hire a producer, produce a record for me. I'll come in and sing. Get writers to write it. You know, I can outsource all that. I can't outsource being a dad. I can't wow. outsource being a husband. That is the only thing I can do. And so, and nobody else can do that. And so mm -hmm. that's that's what I've has been my main focus is positioning us as a family, whether it's through leading worship at a church, which I do now, uh, kind of uh, part-time-ish. I don't have I don't go in for a lot of office hours, uh, but I travel as well and we'll travel together, you know. And so you know, I've just tried to have a perspective of, okay, at the end of the day, you know, nobody really cares if you've won or how many awards you've won, which I haven't won any um, or been nominated. Um, nobody really cares whether you did or not. We're just mm -hmm. floating on a little blue dot in the middle of the universe and nobody <laughs> gives a rip, you know, but there are a handful of people that do and they don't really care if you get those awards or not. They just care if you're there and if you love them. 
Man, that's a mic drop moment right there. <laughs> I love that. So, uh, I've, have you ever heard of the book, The Gap and the Gain? No, no. Who, I'll what have to is send that? it to you. So, it's, it's this really amazing book, and it's exactly what you're talking about. So, basically, what it says is when most of us, you know, live in the gap, which is when we measure where we are now to the ideal place that we hope to end up someday. It's like chasing the horizon. And then the idea is the gain is when we look at what we've accomplished, what we've done. It's instead of measuring to the oblivion, we're measuring back towards our past selves, only looking at the things we've accomplished along the way instead of what we hope to gain one day. And the point is, is when you live in the gap, you're constantly trying to get this thing. You're trying to catch the unicorn, you know, but when you look in, when you live in the gain, you say, Hey man, a year ago, I was nowhere near, just like what you said when you were doing your daily demos in the basement, you know, like you're seeing this song's better than the one from Tuesday. Hey, this song's better than the one from last week. Like that's living in the game. And it sounds like you've spent a lot of time living in that space. And of course it's, it's hard. Like you said, we're constantly magnetically pulled to like, why don't I have that? Why can't I get that? Why did he get that? Why did she do that? How did she do that? You know, like that's like human nature, but it sounds like you've been able to kind of live in a space where you're measuring back against your own accomplishments and where God's brought you instead of what you, what the, you know, industry or whatever thinks that you should do. So that way you can actually have pride and have joy in the successes in the journey instead of like this imaginary horizon that we can't ever catch, you know? So Mm. I'll have to send you that book, man, because it's really good. It's really rocking my world in this, especially in this new year right now, but just in general, it's like, yeah, I live in the in the gap like all the time. So <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. So man, so okay, so you're leading worship um, right now, and you're working on some music. So man, a couple of weeks ago, just in the beginning of this year, 2022, at the time of this recording, uh, you released a song called "Speaking Terms," which, I mean, honestly, it's like it's like a masterpiece. I was like, wow, because I've heard you do like worship and and stuff, and like it's always really good. I mean, your voice is amazing, and. But this this felt a little different to me than what I've heard from you. Is that is that an intentional thing? Like, are you heading in kind of a new direction? And what's sort of your plan or whatever for these these new songs? You know, part of what I enjoy about not being connected to a publisher as a writer is that whatever I write, I can release. Like, yeah. when you're writing for a publisher, you kind of got to, you're writing for another artist, you know? And so, whereas these songs that I'm writing, it's like, well, I can do whatever I want. I don't have to like call anybody or get a license or just put the thing out there. And so <laughs> that's one of the freedoms of not being signed with anybody. But last, uh, last December, uh, on December 1st, I wrote, I wrote, I need Christmas, which I released soon after that, which was bonkers to release it so quick. And then I re-released it this year, but I also wrote a song that I wasn't planning on I didn't think I was ever going to release. And I wrote it in a, during a kind of a quiet time, just kind of a time with the Lord. And it's kind of, it's kind of honest. It's kind of things that, you know, uh, you don't really, if, if you're a ministry leader, you don't really want to admit some of these things. And, you know, the, the first line is just as I have to admit, I, it's been a little while since this feels a little weird to bow my head and pray. And mm-hmm. it's like, what you've been on stage leading worship. Like, why is it weird for you to pray? And, you know, the best way I can describe it is that, you know, you can cook the meal, for people to eat if you've been given the gift of cooking, but that doesn't mean you're eating it and being nourished. Mm. And and I wasn't nourishing myself on the meal that God had called me to cook for others. Wow. And and I remember, at, you know, over, I've been leading worship for 25 years now. It's like over the years, you'll hit seasons where it's like, God, I wish I could partake right now of what I'm helping to be a part of serving here, but I just feel so far. And wow. And there are times where you feel so near you don't know what to say, you know, um, to the Lord. It just feels so uh, close to him. But this song, I remember just writing from a very honest space and I played it for my wife and she, you know, she hears, she's my guinea pig and she hates it half the time just because I have so many songs that I write, <laughs> you know, I, so I'm, I try not to show her too many. And, uh, but this one, I showed it to her and she, it, she was emotional because not because it's like a great song or anything, but because of what it meant. And it meant that I was making an effort to go come back to the Lord in my heart because she knew I was walking through a tough season in my heart of what, you know, 2020 was tough for everybody and everybody has their own ways they processed. And, uh, you know, I I felt like God had called me to something and I stepped out in faith, invested a lot, and it just fell through. And, you know, I just, uh, you know, felt, you know, I wrote in the song, I felt like I was betrayed, you know, 
And, uh, and so, you know, but, but yeah, the song was really raw and honest and I wrote it and recorded a vocal and a, a piano and a vocal and just forgot about it. And this last summer I found it when I was going through some recordings and, and I, as I heard it, I thought, I, I think other people might resonate with this. And I said, I, you know, in that moment, I was like, I don't think a lot of people will, but I think some will. And I think it's worth putting out there. And I was like, I probably won't make any money off this song, and but I'll just put it out because I feel like I'm supposed to. And so mm. I called my friend up, Foster, to add some guitar on it and got some vision for the vibe. And then I got some other instruments on it. Buddy Green played harmonica. Have you ever heard of Buddy Green? I haven't, but I heard the harmonica part. It's great. He is, if you Google Buddy Green, mm-hmm. you will find some incredible harmonica playing. He played with Bill Gaither at, at Carnegie Hall and did a classical wow. piece solo on harmonica, and it was spectacular. Wow. Um, but he was here in my that. studio, standing right there, oh, recording man. on this song. And I had him record on some other songs. And I appreciate the people I got to play on it didn't overplay. And it's almost a very understated kind of a vibe. You know, it just it's more of a moment that it is like you're not going to be wowed by production. Hopefully it just kind of draws you into this raw space of honesty is kind of the goal of that. Man, well, I mean, it. I saw it. It, it showed up on the New Music Friday Christian playlist. So, I mean, it's it's resonating with people already. And I, I, it seems like it's streaming well. And like, I love that though. And it's so, it's so much your story is like, you didn't put it out to be like, look at this, this amazing song I wrote that you guys are going to love. You're just like, you needed it for you. And I feel like that's the honest place. Uh, that's where all great songs begin is when the writer writes it for their own season because they need it, you know, to connect, you know, and in that honesty and that vulnerability, so many of us, I mean, I resonated with the lyrics too, you know, and I didn't even know the story behind it, you know, and I'm sure that there's thousands of others that have and will continue to. So I love that, that you just feel compelled to, to be able to, and like you said, there's a freedom to just get out what, what moves you, you know? So do you have other songs kind of in the tank that you plan to put out this year as well? Yeah. Um, so this was in my mind is kind of a conversation starter. Um, I have probably, uh, six or seven more songs I'm planning to release, uh, in the upcoming year and, uh, probably a couple more than that. Even I, uh, I would like to release a vinyl record, a physical recorder. Remember when you could hold stuff, you know, um, I want to release a vinyl record this fall. And so I'm the sound I'm going for with this record is, you know, it sounds absurd to say, but I want it to sound like something I would expect to hear on vinyl, Mm. which doesn't make sense really because all sorts of music was produced on vinyl. But in my mind, I've, I, it's something that feels timeless. You know, it's Mm. not something where I, I dug up some sounds on output, you know, or the latest vibe or sound, or, you know, I, I want it to be something that 10 years from now, it'll, it won't sound out of place, you know, it'll, and even 15 years, you know, it's like, I want it to be something I want to listen to 10 years from now. And so that's, that's what I think of when I think of vinyl, it's got a raw feel to it, but this song I have coming out is a song we wrote here in this studio with um, some friends of mine that we've started writing the last two or three years, Jonathan Jackson, Holly Salazar, and Emma Feldman. We've started writing here. I call my studio The Threshing Floor, and we've released songs as The Threshing Floor. Yeah. Um, anyway, this song Revival is one of the first songs we wrote together, and we've been waiting to put it out, and I just feel so close to it. We've put it out. It's actually out there, but it's just piano vocal. Mm-hmm. Well, I took it and kind of turned it into a band vibe. And I got some different players to play on it and getting it mixed, hopefully, in the next week or two and hopefully have it out in about a month or so. So that's the goal. And then going to release some more songs like it in the next few months. Man, I was going to ask you about Threshing Floor because I'm a fan because it, it has that House Fires early Mav City vibe, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and I know that song revival because I've listened to the Threshing Floor stuff. And so that'll be, that's exciting to get to hear, you know, the, fleshed out version of the threshing floor song that seems like a tongue twister right there <laughs> right on <laughs> so, sure. so then and and then you also you also release you're doing stuff with that group because jonathan jackson and holly salazar have been on the podcast also i need to get emma on there i mean on here too uh, she'll be next so we'll get the whole yeah, crew yeah. There you go. so but but you guys have all my friends too right you guys is that the same collective yeah so basically we just kind of started writing together and before the pandemic happened we we had connected somehow i I connected with Emma back when I was living in Clarksville and mm-hmm. she was a young, she was still, you know, a teenager. Her mom would come with her over to the studio and just sit in the corner while we wrote. Cause she was like 16, you know, so that'd have been weird. But, uh, but we wrote some pop songs together and, uh, 
And then uh, Jonathan, I connected with, and Holly, I connected with through a mutual friend. We wrote a song, and so we all just kind of came together somehow. And and when we wrote Revival, we were like, we think something special is here, so we kept writing. But some of the songs we started writing were more like, uh, what's a good way to put all my friends stuff? Kind of a light, romantic type of TV commercial type songs that are very sing songy. And uh, we wrote this song specifically for. Uh, I think the beginning of the pandemic uh, called uh, All in This Together. And mm-hmm. it um, it almost feels like that Disney All in This Together song a little bit, but but it was just kind of a vibe. And I produced it myself here in the studio and Jonathan mixed it and we put it out there with a video just to kind of a, it's like, what's everybody else going to do? You know, during the pandemic, you're at home. So we yeah. kind of produced it in our own studios and had a good time with it. But we've just, we'll write these little, um, little songs. And uh, I think one of my favorite ones is a Midday Latte. I don't know if you've heard that one. But I don't know if I've heard that one yet. It it's probably my favorite of the ones we've done. It it's basically the piano you hear on it is this piano here. The day we mm-hmm. wrote it, Jonathan Jackson recorded recorded it. Emma recorded her vocal in here the day we wrote it, and and man, it just has. We got a cellist to play on it, and it just has just a neat vibe to it. Emma's vocal sounds amazing on it, mm. and so um, yeah, we've just been having fun with that. It's been. You know, we've got a couple of more we're working on to put out there and nothing is hit with that yet. I think Mm -hmm. our perspective is more, we think it could land in a sync situation, you know, whether TV or movie or, you know, someday, you know, it's not like we're trying to get a bunch of streams on it. You know, we're just trying to create them to create a catalog to maybe get that idea of all my friends to a film sort of thing that could resonate with that vibe. I love that, man. Yeah, it's it's fun, you know, And, and sometimes that sync stuff is just like, it doesn't have to be heady. It's literally just meant for a mood. You know, it's like yeah. pick a mood, write a song that points to that mood, and then that's it. So, I, you know what I do? When you said cello, I do think I've heard Midday Latte. I think that yeah, that's a, just a just good like vibe music. So mm-hmm. that's awesome that you guys are able to do the worship stuff, but then also that and it kind of shows the versatility of you guys as a group, but then also just individually because because everything you're putting out is, is really good. So something I always like to ask people, I think this is really valuable and you've said so much good stuff already, but is there a piece of advice you'd give to your younger self, whether label days, pre-label days or last week or yesterday, whatever, like that, that you would help you on your journey and then anyone listening? You know, you you gave me plenty of time to wrestle with that question, and I I and I thought about it multiple times. And there are things I would tell myself. You know, I think if I could learn to be content sooner. You know, mm. Paul says godliness with contentment is great gain. Wow. And I'm an Enneagram Seven. I don't know if you're a, in, on the Enneagram stuff or not, but Enneagram Sevens have a hard time with contentedness. And I when I, I read, you know, I've done all the personality things, whatever. But when I read that one, I was like, okay. That makes sense because like my life verse for the last 10 years has been godliness with contentment is great gain. And and he was specifically talking about money at the time. Like he is, you know, I do well, you know, I've learned to do well whether I've much or I've little. And 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 that's oftentimes, you know, our struggle is like, well, if I had this, if I had that, or you know, if I didn't have this, you know, baggage of a loan or whatever, you know, that you're walking through, it's like things would be so much better. But you know, godliness. Focusing on the Lord, centering your life on Him, not perfection, but godliness, with being happy with where you are, who you are, what you're called into, and what you're doing, that is great gain. That is wealth. That is the paycheck that you're chasing after that you're never going to get mm. unless you focus on the kingdom of God. And, you know, I, I think I, I would just say focus on being content a lot sooner and because um, one thing that I, I learned over the years is when I would look back in the past, I would think about the past joyfully. I'd be, mm-hmm. I think, man, those were good times. But in my early years, I would be very frustrated while in that past. Like in the mm-hmm. moment, I'd be so frustrated with what wasn't happening yet with this or that or whatever. And But when I would leave that time period and look back, I'd be like, man, those were good times. And I'm like, wait, but I wasn't really that happy in that time. Wow. Um, but then I, I, well, I thought, what if I can fast forward my joy of this moment and take the joy I know I'm going to feel in the future and pull it into now and let that supersede the frustration, the angst, the discontent that I'm having now. So it's <sighs> living in the present, taking joy in what I know will be true about the past, but now. That's so, man... I'm so with you on that, like in a couple different ways. But first of all, you know, 
you've you've had or you I don't know how old your sons are, but I've got a seven year old, almost eight, and a five and a half year old. And you know, everybody says, you know, this is the best time of your life, you know, and I know that. And even as hard as it is, I know that I'm going to miss it. So, like, why don't, why can't I enjoy it more frequently mm. than I do? You know, in a, par- a parental way. But then, in, in on the other side, and I've thought about this a lot, and I actually wrote a song about this, a, a bad song, a few years ago. But if if I know, if I can see God in the past, if I can know that He's working, and I can feel His presence right now with the Holy Spirit here then why do I have such a hard time trusting that he'll be there tomorrow? Because soon, Mm. today will be tomorrow, and I know he'll be there too. But then why is it so difficult to actually Mm. just let it go and not try to grip what's coming? You know, Mm. I think about that so much, and that's exactly what you just said, man. So, I'm so... Mm there with you that's so important and why is it so why is it so hard <laughs> it's, it's a challenge you know there's a, a phrase that we have a placard of in our kitchen that says these are the good old days oh, yes and that I'll, when i look at that i have to remind myself you know sometimes i've walked up to my wife on bad days and said you know as bad as today is in 20 years we'd, we'd spend a million dollars to come relive this day Another mic drop moment. You're just, you're just, you're just dropping those fifty sevens on the floor, man. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, at least they can endure the drop. We know they can. We've all got. I've got a dented <laughs> one in the case behind me. Yeah. Come on, <laughs> man. So thanks for doing this. This is it's been a blast. To, like I said, you know, I feel like I've I've seen you for years. So it's been great to connect here. And you know, before we go, I always love to have people. You know, let people know how they can find you. So what's the best place to find you? Other than you know, and I'll link it all below and everything. But wh- where can people connect with you? Yeah. Um, you know, if you want general information, my website has some general info on it. Um, and, but I would say Instagram, uh, just Daniel Doss Music or Facebook are the two best ways to get in touch with me. Um, you can through my website. It's not, it's updated. The dates are, but the music isn't super updated. Uh, but yeah, uh, we'll love to connect on Instagram and uh, you can that way. Cool. And I'll link Spotify below so people yeah. can stay up to date with these songs coming out and go check out Speaking Terms because it's a great song and I'm a fan. So Thanks, man. And I'm excited to hold that vinyl record this year. So, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be Thanks, good. Brother. Yeah. So, l- before we go, I always like to pray over people. So, I'm going to pray for you, man, before we go. So, God, thank you so much for this time we've got to spend with Daniel here and just... Uh, Thank you for his willingness to just serve along the way. And he's never got caught up in what could be or what should be. He just, he seems to just be able to live in the moment, God. And that's, that's what you called us to. Yes, you're, you're always pointing to the future. You're doing a new thing. You're springing up wells, but also your Holy Spirit is meant for us in this moment. So, what an incredible testimony it is that he's gone through all these different seasons of life from leading worship to being a signed artist to being a signed writer. And, and, and now all of those skills have kind of brought him to where he is, but ultimately serving as a husband and a father is the most important thing through it all. And being able to pass those skills off to his sons and whatever other family connections he has, God, that they can just see a man that's living in the moment with you. And that is something that is is so remarkable, especially in this date where we're so inundated with things that we should be doing or who we should be, God, for him to be settled in your presence is an amazing encouragement to me personally. And I hope anyone listening, God, we just pray continued influence, continue creativity, continue inspiration as he journeys on through this year of new music, God, and, and that part of those songs impact people in ways that he, he came and imagined, God. Thank you so much for your presence. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Brian.